The content presented today is not directed to any investors or potential investors and does not constitute an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to buy any securities. And with that being said, uh, it is my great honor to introduce Ranjan Nag, Dr. Ranjan Nag, Managing Partner at R42, and Roger Lowe, Managing Partner at Embedding VC. Um, yep, Ranjan, why don't you uh, start and introduce yourself? Uh, perfect. Uh, really nice to be here, Niels. Thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, my name's Ron John Narg. Uh, I really have three personas. Uh, I'm an investor. Um, I'm a teacher. I teach uh, AI and uh, 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 longevity science at Stanford University. And I'm an inventor. So I've been inventing things for really 40 years. My first AI system was 40 years ago. And I've sold one company, Motorola one to BlackBerry, one to Apple. Uh, so the most prominent companies in mobile the last 40 years. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ron John. Roger, uh, why don't you go ahead and start introducing yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you. And uh, my name is Roger. I'm manager of uh, Embedding VC. So uh, I'm an AI operator to uh, investors. I've been working on AI entire my career. Got my PhD on machine learning in 2011 before AI was a uh, cool. And uh, like uh, I've been uh, like uh, leading AI teams at different technology companies and being uh, two times AI SaaS co-founders where we're actually the first company to AWS. And like uh, been actively doing angel investment and uh, leading syndicate in the past seven years before I decided to make the leap to become a full-time investor. Thank you so much, Roger. So uh, what inspired both of you to uh, become a manager investing in AI? Roger? Yeah. It's the question for me, sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, for me, uh, it, it's quite nature, right? So like uh, different from the momentum investors uh, I mentioned early, like I work on AI entire my career, right? It has always been my key focus. Right. So I always believe in the like the mission of achieving AGIs. So with the breaking of like a generative AI technology, right, I think uh, we are this uh, onset of this new uh, computing super uh, cycles really fundamentally driven by the AI innovation. Right. So then next come to the question like uh, like uh, why do I want to be uh, like a uh, professional fund managers uh, instead of just doing angel investment. So overall, I found that uh, I, uh, I really enjoy working with investors, supporting them in their journey. And uh, like with the experience I've gained the uh, last two decades, uh, I would like to give back and uh, supporting uh, like a uh, next generation of uh, entrepreneurs in building like the, the next, the, the exciting companies. I see. Ranjan, you mentioned you have multiple personas. How, how did your AI investor persona come to be? Well, after uh, being an entrepreneur for many years, uh, and my uh, my first AI system was at 83, and Roger, I beat you. My PhD was in 88. Uh, <laughs> so we not that we're competitive, of course, um, but... Uh, I, I was doing a lot of angel investing, so I've invested about 60 companies. And then um, there's a program at Stanford where you can go back to university and uh, after a 30 year career and you can take um, courses with a 20 year old. So I did all my biology courses there and my medicine courses there. And the idea is, what are you going to do for the next 30 years? Because I, you know, I, I believe we're going to live to 120. Uh, our, our kids will live to 150. Um and so you don't have to rush things. And so what are you going to do? And so I really came at the end of that, say, well, let's do what I'm doing anyway, but professionalized in a professionalized format. And so because you do it as a professional fund manager, then uh, you can put processes in and you can put a bit more discipline. And also uh, you can increase your status as an investor. Uh, right. it, it turns out if you're a, just Ron John, you're up you're kind of like there's a hierarchy of investors, and Ron John is at the bottom, and then uh, mm -hmm. then it goes a little bit higher to MIT angels. But as soon as you have your own firm, even if it's just you, uh, you can actually make a little bit more of an impact. People listen to you a bit more. Uh, so so uh, it, it uh, that was a, a dynamic, and then I could help the companies more. I could right. uh, write bigger checks. 
uh, get give them more status. I could lead a deal uh, uh, versus an individual, even though it's really the same person. Very interesting. So you mentioned uh, longevity being a big focus. Uh, what role do you see AI playing in that field? Well, uh, certainly um, in medicine, uh, a lot of the AI applications are now being applied to biology and medicine. Uh, and now I'll crack another little joke. You know, I started looking at the biologists, talk, started talking to them, and I found out that they're using trial and error all this time. And uh, uh, there's something now called but data science uh, that we introduced to them. And I'm sort of saying this tongue in cheek a little bit, but uh, uh, there's kind of a shift where biology uh, is turning into an engineering subject. Right. And uh, as a result, a lot of people are coming into the biological field from other disciplines. It turns out it's a interdisciplinary problem that no one person, and we see this in other domains as well, that no one person uh, one field can solve the problem and the human body is so complex uh, it really lends itself to uh, computational uh, techniques that's very interesting now both of you also have like an extensive uh, background in education and maybe question for roger how, how are we seeing ai like impact the field of education i I think I'm very excited about the AI uh, in the field of education. Like it does make the like the uh, make uh, like education more accessible, right? In, in the past, like uh, uh, for for Ronjan and I and some of us who are based in uh, like California Bay Area, we have the access to uh, the the top universities, some of the best of the mind, and uh, like it's. It's very different from people in other part of the world and who may not have at least access. But we, now with uh, like the large language model empowered uh, tutors, mm -hmm. right? You are able to you can ask uh, uh, many questions uh, directly. So that, that's another. And also uh, like I'm an investor of a uh, of a uh, tool for K to twelve teachers uh, called Magic School. So like uh, I've, it's also bring a lot of value now. Like uh, it's a uh, it's bypass one million user at in K to twelve teachers, and on average, uh, like the user use it for the teacher use it for doing like a cost planning, uh, writing student reviews. On average, it saves the like the teachers uh like a one or two hours every day, uh, in in their daily work, which allow make the uh them like the, the teacher have more time to uh to to do, uh, to to just uh, to focus on students to uh, to do teaching. As well as uh, like uh, provide more personalized, uh, like a uh, uh, homework and uh, curriculums for their student. Yeah, this is just another example of uh, how it uh, could, could right. change the education system. Yeah, you mentioned it's saving like teachers a lot of uh, hours. This is also saving students a lot of hours now. In terms of, I, I can imagine the whole field of homework is uh, getting disrupted. Is it forcing teachers to become more creative in like what assignments they give to uh, children, and is that a good thing? I'll have a go. Uh, I, I think maybe um, it actually increases the level of expectations that you expect from your students so uh, i mean i think universities are a bit confused about um you know what to do and uh, you can't use chat gpt uh, and now they're saying you must use chat gpt uh, mm -hmm. because we want our students to be out there in the world to be prepared and they're going to have these tools and it's a bit like the pocket calculator when that came out um right. You no, know, he said you can't use a pocket calculator. Then the teacher said, "Oh, well, I don't have to round the numbers up anymore. I can just give any old numbers because I know they can just add it up." So now I think the students may think they're getting a free ride, but actually the expectations are going to be bigger. You know, we're expecting more quality right. uh, from okay, the out. That's very interesting. Another uh, thing about us is I say they they should use it. They should use it, but then tell us, tell me they're using it as well. I think another year or two we won't need to. Uh, to, uh, have them declare that because we'll just assume they're using it just like we assume they're using google and not going to the library right is it fair to say that we're in like a huge transition period in terms of uh how we're viewing ai and like the expectations of the roles it plays in society well i think this is the key question and i mentioned roger's viewpoint 
is this simply an extension of the industrial revolution going back decades or even a century and this is the latest thing you know, maybe it was uh, the iphone a few years ago and the internet a few years before that and this is just another one or is this a dramatic change you know is this some a, clearly an inflection point uh clearly there, there's a rapid movement but is it really something anything different to all the other innovations we have from time to time and um i guess i'm on the extension of the industrial revolution side but i'd be interested in what roger thinks so am i roger uh, yeah i've been thinking about this uh like i agree that it's an extension of uh, the industrial revolution but however i i feel that right so internet make information more accessible and uh, also make the earth more flat but however uh, with this ai i feel it's really uh like uh, beside make the information available could also augment uh, the cognitive and uh, the human's uh, ability. So I feel that in this sense, it's, it's different. And but uh, like uh, uh, you could also argue that uh, like uh, the the uh, like the, the, the like the dimension of the like the 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 the, the uh, steam machines and the others like also um, or like the the make the like the, the humans are uh, able to assess to a more challenging environment also able to to uh like uh, to to in, in, uh, like uh, make, make uh, like a uh, more a more more dramatic change to to the their, their life so uh in, in less sense i feel that's similar but uh, like definitely it's a uh, it's the time that the the, the, the cognitive process uh, like uh, with with the argument of ai i, I feel it's could could uh could uh, result in more dramatic uh change okay. i think there is going to be a commoditization it used mm -hmm. to be again maybe it's like the pocket calculator you know if you couldn't mm -hmm. add up or multiply you couldn't go into engineer but then calculate mm. came up and you can do right. and you can do it and now i think as a commoditization you know maybe you weren't very good at uh coding or you weren't very good at getting your right. thoughts out in a cogent manner mm. now all of a sudden there's a whole set of people who had difficulty they can be uplifted right to a level playing field it. it might actually make you know if you're already uplifted you you might you know maybe squashed down a mm. bit you may not be mm. sitting at your elite level mm. like you did before over your uh colleagues but uh, it's, there's probably going to be a squashing. More people would be able to do more things. So you see it as like a great equalizer in some ways, Ron John? I think I do. I do. I do. I mean, uh, you know, in my own case, I, I, I put more bugs in code than I do in code code. Um, <laughs> and and I found that, that that even me, I could just put code and it fixes it for me, right? I find errors and it fixes it for me uh, much, much quicker. And I think, you know, if you're in, if you're a writer, um you know i'm trying to write a book i've got writers writers block and all that uh it's been helping me uh uh sort of uh unlock that and so all these people never thought they could write a book maybe they can write one now right and in, in terms of business are we seeing the same thing in that um people who would never be entrepreneurs are suddenly starting businesses that uh, can be highly successful leveraging the power of ai uh, my observation is that uh, it's at least it's become much easier to start a software company, right? So like uh, ten years ago, with the like uh, cloud computing, it's become uh, much easier for a startup to get bootstrapped, but like with uh, like uh, less uh less engineering talent. Uh, uh, right now, like uh, the like uh, with the help of this uh, like uh, code generation tools, uh, like you definitely demand even less resource. I haven't seen I've seen like a two to three person team uh, with uh, uh, just one technology talent able to uh, to build a, to, to to achieve a lot with very limited resource. So I would say definitely make it much easier. Uh, like, uh, I don't, I haven't, uh, like as I mainly work with a uh, software startup. So, uh, like, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I, I will curious to, to hear if Roger have seen the same from like other, the other verticals uh, sectors. Yeah. Well, I think it's a macro trend in science and technology that things are getting easier. The tool, I mean, it's, I guess it's supply demand, you know, when there's a problem, uh, people provide tools, so it's not a problem anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't need to do a PhD in five years of experience to to get. I mean, when I was starting, literally, you needed a PhD and five years post PhD experience mm -hmm. to start working in the field. 
And now it's different. There are other domains. It's not just algorithm um, engineers. They have different functions, you know. So, okay, you need to retrain your model. But when do you retrain? Where do you store the data? Where do you have the data lake? Uh, it's a whole different skill. It's not an algorithm skill. It's a different uh, uh, skill to do that. And so these things um, are popping up where uh, you can actually do it in a few lines of code. Um, you know, there's something called a neural network. And I often show in my class, what does that look like in code? And it's a 138 layer neural network uh, is about four lines of code, right? Because there's now libraries and things that people can use. Um, and you can even do it easy. There's drag and drop systems and things like that, um, both in biology and in uh, 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 in uh, um, uh, other domains, mm -hmm. uh, English literature. I mean, at Stanford, pretty much every department is looking at AI. The law department's looking at AI, anthropology department, English literature. Is Francis Bacon the same as William Shakespeare? Is that the same person? It used to be a scholar right. who'd have to read both texts and try and figure it out. We need, don't need to do that anymore. You can have a machine read it for you and uh, give you the statistical uh, uh, analysis. Uh, there's a million medical papers written every year. No one's got time to read them. We have a machine read them for you. Right. Um, Everything's moving at breakneck speed. Are we going at the right speed, or would you say we're we may be going too fast, too slow? Uh, curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I think that's what people are worried about. They're moving yeah. too quickly. I mean, basically, you cannot... Are we going at the right speed? Um, well, you cannot stop progress. Uh, yeah. And so a lot of these things that say, oh, let's slow down. You can't slow down. People will just do it. It's not practical and pragmatic um, to say, uh, you know, maybe you can regulate four or five big tech companies, but you can't regulate the world. Uh, and so uh, what will happen, anything that's possible will be done. That's my belief, whether you have any uh, uh, efforts to slow things down or not. What you do need, I think, is education. You know, education where everyone can have uh, a grounding, and I spend a lot of my time thinking about that not for altruistic reasons um it's much more efficient for me to interact with 100 people at the same time like a session like this right. and say let's look at the vocabulary what does this mean what what uh, you know people say oh we don't know how it works well we do know how it works it's, it, it, it's not my fault the human brain can't handle 175 billion parameters <laughs> we, we can actually unwrap it and <laughs> get all the parameters <laughs> Um, and anyway, I'll stop there for a second. <laughs> Roger, if you want to get in here. Uh, I don't have much to add. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Roger, okay. Roger give a really good answer. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, but briefly touching on the flip side of this, right? Um, AI as a great equalizer or AI as like, uh, future job losses. Uh, what can people do to try and like mitigate that and try and prevent getting replaced by a machine more or less <laughs> well i think the, the standard thing is you grab the bull by the horns and not bury your head in the sand and learn what ai can do and you're using ai uh i mean the standard joke in computer science is um you know if you've got a niece or a or a uh, daughter that wants to do medicine is fine, do medicine. But whatever you do, don't be a radiologist because uh, you know computer vision is better than radiology. So I had a radiologist come into my class and say, well, what do you think of this? And I said, well, yeah, yeah, the profession's very worried about this. Um, but you know what? Uh, play it forward 10 years. Uh, those of us who grab the tools yeah. will make our medical colleagues in adjacent disciplines look like witch doctors. Because we will have the tools and we'll be superhuman, right? Now, those of us who don't grab the tools, yes, could be run over. So that's the usual thinking is you know, how to stay ahead, stay get, stay educated um, and be part of the, uh, the, the revolution. But it's nothing new. You know, the internet, you have, to, you have to know what that was. Mobile phones, you, know, you have to know what that was. I don't see right. anything uh, specific about this. So we're joined by a lot of fund managers today. Uh, the two of you are obviously quite established in your careers uh, 
the AI field, what, what can like new and emerging managers who are looking at this, this field do to like get started really? Like, do you have some general advice for new entrants? I'll let Roger take, I've been nattering on. I'll let Roger answer this one first. Uh, I would say uh, still focus on your value add and uh, differentiators. Like I assume most of the audience today are early stage investors. So for early stage investors, uh, like uh, still fall back to the, like the, the, the proprietary uh, or like for early stage, right? It's uh, your network. Uh, low thing doesn't change. Right, so we see it's a network business, and uh, then like uh, what you can work out is really focus on the value add and the uh, differentiator and uh, build uh, connections uh, with funder and supporting them. Uh, there's uh, one thing, uh, uh, like because uh, AI is a far, very fast moving field. Uh, 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 like I think it's also important to to be a good technologist and to focus on uh, to have a vision on what's the the future look like. So it can help you identify the diamonds in in the in in the startup space. Yeah. Very interesting, Ron John. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, show up to things. I mean, this this is a great event. Um, pretty much depending where you are uh, in the Bay Area, is pretty much an event almost every day, every night. Uh, uh, if you're not in the Bay Area, then there's webinars, uh, seminars. Um, it's overblown with. Um, courses uh right now i'm teaching a course at stanford you still we just had the first class yesterday it's 450 people registered for that class uh oh. it's available online maybe i'll post that yeah, um so yeah and it's one uh so six lectures very very quick uh I, I think um i think uh what roger said that you know we don't know what we don't know right so we kind of like in other fields but i do think it's a bit like the internet we kind of like didn't know what we didn't know uh one of the dangers you have to think about is a lot of those internet companies at the beginning blew up uh mm -hmm. those of us who are old enough remember pets.com webmd yes. not webmd webmd, WebMD still work. webvan webvan mm -hmm. webmd is a successful company um uh, uh and uh yeah those concepts exist today right as successful companies as chewy.com and um and the like and so what we have to think about is what are the latent uh, uh strengths of companies today that you would invest in mm -hmm. so it doesn't become a pets.com but does become an amazon.com right um and my intuition is uh uh proprietary data uh the second one is uh sort of a unique application not so much of it there's probably a lot sort of crowded space of um various kind of uh uh chat body type things uh but can you actually find like i think we heard talk about the teaching thing maybe there's a vertical there uh that can you can look at and mm -hmm. then uh either you have experience that vertical or you get it you get expertise in that vertical uh, uh, through through what okay. through uh, one way or another um and then i think there's probably, I mean, I only, I only, I know, I sort of tend to work in the Bay Area and the UK. I'm British, as you can probably tell, but um, I think there's I, good ideas everywhere. The laws of physics are exactly the same in <laughs> Dhaka, Bangladesh, as they are in Palo Alto. Uh, and uh, no, so I'm a highly unsnobbish people, even though I'm a uh, person, uh, even though I teach at Stanford and. Uh, uh, uh and, and the like that um these tools are available to anybody around the world right. and so there might be some cost advantages in other areas but um you know the markets are still here in the us maybe china uh to to look at i'll stop there uh, yeah no that's a great answer and it ties into a question we have from the chat adrian wong is asking so when you're conducting early screening and due diligence on ai startups like what do you focus on and what do you evaluate first uh, all right I, I can answer oh, this go ahead, Roger, uh, go ahead, Roger. yeah so uh still go back to uh because we are doing early stage right so it's still mainly like evaluating the funders uh like uh uh, the evaluating the funders vision and uh, which funder have a good funder market fit and uh, 
also uh, like uh, think more strategically about uh, like the space uh, the funder picking and uh, if it's uh, like uh, I I I uh, like if it fit with the uh, uh, if it's if, like, uh, is it because uh, like uh, this is uh, uh, like uh, uh, everyone is adopting AI, right? So like uh, when uh, like every company we become an AI company, uh, but however, uh, like uh, what will be the st startups uh, uh, key advantage mode, right? Startups move fast, much move move much much faster, and uh, so if there's a good team which can deliver move fast as well as uh, like uh, a focus on sectors where like. Uh, 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 like incumbents cannot move very fast, and that where, where a startup will have a key advantage. Let, then the others are like a more like a case by case, uh, like a checklist need to need to fulfill, yeah, need to make the decision. Got it. Ron John, what's your take? Yeah, I think there's an arc of a discussion where they found. I'm always so saying. First of all, what's the product? Uh, why is this different? What is the uh, moat that you can provide? The moat could be a proprietary data set. It could be access to a particular market segment. Uh, who are you? you know, are you new to the space? Uh, uh, what uh, is your uh, advantage? Have you sort of used a tool that's out there? Um, in which case, why can't someone else do that? Right. Uh, or have you built it from scratch? In which case, that sounds expensive. Right, but there's, there's no right answer. Uh, but we, as an investor, as an evaluator, you want to probably try and uh, find out what the answer is. Um, and then, uh, thirdly, you know, where have you come from? Right, what's your, uh, what's the team background come from? And as, uh, again, I'm not a snob. You know, basically, uh, clearly, sometimes it's helpful that they've had a strong academic PhD. Uh, background and been writing algorithms for years sometimes it doesn't matter i mean i know how to drive a car i don't know how to build a car uh, right. but i can drive it safely and i can get from a to b and uh, and my passengers are very very comfortable uh, and so you have to sort of analyze the problem in that way um, and the third uh, the fourth thing is thinking about okay what's the final arc is what's the um uh, potential return on investment and it goes up and down. I've seen great, mm. um, I've seen, uh, uh, you've got to do a calculation on uh, what you think the return on investment be vis-a-vis -vis the valuation of the company. So some companies have no revenues. Right. right? Yeah. And then people will argue, well, yeah, but I've got eyeballs and, uh, and, I, and I could charge if I wanted to, but I don't because, uh, and so my valuations in that metric, some people said, well, okay, I've got this amount of revenues, got this amount of profits, if I have profits, and then you you get to more of a financial metric. He said, well, really, I don't care. Oh, it happens to be okay, AI, but that's incidental, right? You're just making boatloads of money and yeah. it costs you this amount to get that money. And uh, so you've got to see which bucket they're in. So that's how I think, in analyzing companies and there's no real right answer bottom line can i actually add value can i actually work with the founders do we get on with each other often you don't know until after you start working but being able to uh sometimes it's like they call it myers briggs personality test a right. guy might be brilliant but they don't like my style where i'm talking while i'm thinking uh, a lot of people think first and then talk uh and when you clash those people together they don't get on very well yeah, even they, they really happen. <laughs> there's a lot in that answer that i could uh hone in on um but let me let me go to this so, uh you, you mentioned the cost right so current lms they're very uh capital expensive will these costs keep ballooning and can companies like OpenAI and some others like afford to stay loss leaders uh, or is the check due at some point? Well, it's market grab. They're doing it, they're doing it, you know, Microsoft, et cetera, OpenAI, they're mm -hmm. saying, let's just grab market share. This is a blip. And it's a bit like internet 1999, right? Who cares, right? If you play it for 2004. Uh, but uh, in my experience in AI, there is a thing that could unseat that. Uh, and we've seen it in other, over the 10, 20 years, people used to brag 
about how big their models were. And we're seeing this bragging. Oh, no, mine's mine's 13 billion parameters. Oh, mine's 40 billion. Right. Mine's 176 billion. Mine's 1.7 trillion parameters, right? But what we found historically, we used to have that with convolution neural nets. I have two layers, I have five layers, I have 10 layers, I have 32 layers, I have 300 layers. And then somebody comes back, well, I can do the same thing with eight layers. And we're seeing beginnings of that now in AI and LLMs. We're saying, well, you know, the Llama 2 is only 40 billion parameters, not 170 billion parameters. We even see, you know, Lamini coming, running on a Raspberry Pi, which is a children's <laughs> computing platform. And when we don't have, you know, certainly in academia, we don't have the computing power that Google has, we become cleverer, right? We start right. writing in assembler. We start thinking, well, do we need 176 billion? No, maybe we can do, no, a lot of these mean a zero. We don't need to store them yeah. all. We don't need to compute them. You start becoming cleverer uh, right. and necessity becomes the mother invention. And then you say, well, what are you guys, you know, why are you doing 10 to the 36 flops to compute this? I can do it on my laptop. Right, because I've thought, thought, and I think there is that trend sort of happening now. Okay, okay. Roger, are you also seeing this like less is more trend of, or a trend of like optimization in AI? Yeah, I think there are two faults, right? So beside optimizations, right? So like I mentioned, we're also in a, like a super computing, computing, computing cycles, and uh, like a GPU is uh, getting faster and cheaper, right? So it's a uh, like a uh, uh, it's outside a uh, a lot of, like uh, it's move go go faster than the, the Moore's law. So we will see the, the computation cost uh, uh, like uh, uh, dropping down dramatically as well. Also, uh, so let, let's let these uh, laws uh, less famous uh, like uh, named by after like a uh, JSON of NVIDIA called Huang's law. So you can you can Google that. And uh, beside that, I think uh, just uh, uh, like like one example was uh, which Roger mentioned. Like uh, I was an early employee of Snapchat that helped build uh, its AI machine learning team. Like oh, Snapchat was mainly doing video messaging, so video was so expensive. The company was losing a lot of money. Uh, right. So like there are people was uh, be uh, pessimistic about this for several years. So there's no way for like a video company to earn money. Uh, YouTube was the same, like keep losing money. But until now, like you can see uh, TikTok is uh, like a massive successful company. So YouTube is pretty, pretty right. a lot of money. So we, we definitely see the like the technology advance and uh, reduce the cost. Yeah, I'm doing it. Okay, interesting. Yeah, it's not too dissimilar to a lot of things in venture, yeah. right? Or, uh, yeah. As Roger Ron John mentioned, it's a land grab, and if you can hold on to your land, you you can win very big. Uh, speaking of like another thing in your answer previously, Ron John was the concept of moats. Uh, a lot of the companies we were seeing pop up today are like wrappers, right? That are heavily reliant on Chat GPT and other larger companies. Are are those like very investable to you, or is there a lack of moat? there um i wouldn't say they're uninvestable uh i mean who commoditizes who is the question right right so you can say well i've got a wrapper it's open ai today tomorrow it's llama 2 somebody the day after okay. it's uh it's uh, uh, uh it, 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 it's anthropic uh and let them fight it out and they drive the price down for those it sounds expensive now but keeps the price low because anyone who starts to charge more uh, becomes uh, uh, uncompetitive, or is the other way around? You know, the best, biggest, the best, the baddest uh, uh, LLM model. And by the way, we're just talking LLMs right now, which is you know we're right. fixated yeah. on language, right? And there are other modes of AI. There's pictures and there's sound. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a sort of interpretation. There's emotion. Uh, it's uh, it's there. So I think um, you really have to think for yourself and you might have to, just like invention, that's not unusual. You might have to be contrarian. There'll right. be a lot of people saying, why are you being so stupid investing in a rapper company that raps on something else? Uh, and then it could be the other way around. You're building your own LLM that's smaller or faster or cleverer than everyone else's. Why are you being so stupid to compete with open AI? They've got a billion dollars. <laughs> right. Um, uh, but I'm uh you know, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Uh, a lot of it is uh uh hustling and just like in every other business, 
uh, ducking and diving, establishing more partnerships than anyone else. If you're nicer than anyone else, if you're not mean, meaner, if you're not mean, you might get more customers. There's, there's sort of a counterbalancing effect. Right. Uh, Roger, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I think Rajan's answer uh, resonates with me a lot, right? So the uh, beside the uh, look at technology, I feel that the OMO is the new mode, like a uh, focus on network effect, your product, and uh, like the uh, like your distributions, uh, your brandings. Those were gradually uh, company building is hard. I think people understand underestimate how hard it is to build a company. Right, OpenAI is a superpower now, but uh, with its scale, right. so it's hard to maintain the the speed or the momentum uh, it, it could possibly have. And uh, then focus on this. And uh, if you got a, you win the customer, you win the you win the distribution. You have the data. And as LM become more commodity, right? Open source is moving extremely fast, and so like uh, the the company could even establish their their technology mode in the future. Ranjan, you mentioned that uh, yeah, we are hyper focused on LLMs uh, at the moment, and like I would, LLMs definitely last year had their moment in the sun of like, oh, this works, and people immediately started using it, right? What what other AI based technologies do you foresee in like the next I don't know five years uh, surprise us with like, like similar oh wow moments? Yeah, I think it's uh, in the the sensor area, robotics area that's just beginning to pop up now. Just seeing a few articles, and uh, Elon Musk has got his robot, and uh, uh, historically that's been a difficult space. Right. Um, you know, iRobot stock, I think it was down 34% a uh, couple of days. Was it yesterday or today? I can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it is uh, um, really finding you know, the next generation of uh, human machine interfaces uh, that are going to, so it's more hardware centric uh, and the like. So people are right now saying, well, hardware is hard. Um, People don't know what to do with these robots. Is it consumer robot? Is it manufacturing robots? Um, but in the end, my vision, you know, why am I why am I interested in AI? Well, really, it's Star Trek. You know, those of a certain generation, uh, we, I said, well, why are you even an engineer if you didn't watch Star Trek? I, because what, 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 <laughs> that's what inspired me. And of course, there's a there's a character in Star Trek in Star Trek: The Next Generation called Data, who's an android who is forever asking himself whether he could why wasn't he human. And a lot of people ask me, well, Rondra, why do you want to even build that? Why, why does that want to, why do you even want to do that? What purpose is that? Um, I think you don't know what you don't know, but if you had one that was as good as us, they call this uh, uh, strong AI, uh, uh, artificial, general, artificial general intelligence, uh, where it's as good as a human. By the way, the actual definition of AI was really human-like performance. So actually nothing we see today actually is defined by AI, by the original definition. But we've now renamed what AI means as anything with a formula at this point. Uh, and so uh, I think really, can we get there the five next five, 10 years into uh, uh, um, physical interaction? There's a robot right. called Kismet uh, done by Rodney Brooks at uh, MIT about 20 years ago. He believed you really couldn't get uh, real... Uh, intelligence unless you had something that could move and touch and feel right mm -hmm. so we've still got a machine in a box and LLM is still in the box it's not touching it's not moving um and so really maybe you need to go back to to the, that original concept that's great uh roger uh same question for you are there any like things that you think will wow us uh in the next five years yeah, as a software investor, I also agree that hardware is hard, but I do keep a like a close attention to the to the hardware uh like a progress, which is finally the lead to a lot of these advancements in AI. Right? But embodiment Roger mentioned is something I feel I, I think interesting. I'm also uh like uh uh very excited even through I, I don't know it well well about uh, the the advancement on the uh, on in the like biomedical side, alpha fold seem to to be uh, another uh, like breakthrough, which are like uh, uh, under the attention or like uh, 
uh, or like compared to large language model, I so like uh, will have like uh, the not, not getting the, the 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 same public attention as uh, it like uh, as it's supposed to, and uh, and uh, all these foundation model uh, like for for uh, other field uh, like uh, it's also uh, exciting things to look at, but uh, the data will be much harder to capture. It might take a few years, but uh, as uh, uh, as people see the. Uh, See, see the the powerfulness of it, uh, like uh, mm -hmm. uh, on the on the language side. Uh, I believe there will be like ambitious, uh, uh, like uh, in, uh, entrepreneurs or companies are going to fund some of this work. Okay, you mentioned biomedical, and we do have a number of questions uh, about that in the chat. One is going from Haas. Um, a question on longevity: Why are we all of a sudden the believers in longevity? Why now? Dietary habits as well as social habits are, for his opinion, probably the worst on average uh, to date and 50 years back. What makes you confident that we are prolonging our lives from this point onward? Uh, I guess that's for me, is it? Well, probably uh, because I'm voting with my feet uh, and, 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 and my dollars, I think. I'm voting with my feet. Um, so certainly the average age of death, uh, st statistically, has actually declined. It used to be 78 and now it's 76. However, there's more people hitting the age of 100 uh, than ever before. Uh, some of that, the low-hanging fruits being done, sewage, um, uh, antibiotics, uh, uh, easy medicine, access to medicine. A lot of it's social, you know, access to medicine, but how much does it cost? Um, the next step is, you know, I think even with diet and exercise, we kind of all know what we need to do. We can add another 10, 20 years. Right. Uh, that gets you to probably 80, 90, 80 to 100, more certain to get 100. Uh, the oldest living person uh, is now 117. The right. oldest living person who ever lived was 122. So there's a lot of biological phenomena. They sort of terminate 115, 116 or so. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to need something radically different. And uh, there are a few concepts that have come out in the last two or three years. Um, sorry, last... Uh, 10 or 20 years um, which uh, make us think that we can change things there's something called epigenetic reprogramming we can change this the age of a cell by changes four factors from its current age to its an early age uh, there is these senescent cells these old cells that become older and older uh, we can try and remove those and it turns out people uh, actually uh, uh, become uh uh, quicker faster stronger uh, but can we do that on a on a mass scale well we have new tools available to us you know i'm actually personally working on a vaccine and you might say what a vaccine for what well i'm working on a vaccine for aging and uh old science was using the immune system new science we've got gene editing we've got uh uh, uh, uh computational drug discovery uh, we've got epigenetic reprogramming. Right. Uh, so there's a lot more tools we have about, but you have to put the vision out there. I'm not right. sure any of you know, but there's actually a prize for the first person or entity to add 10 or 20 years of life. And the prize is $101 million for anyone who can do that. Good so <laughs> <laughs> it's called the uh, Heather. Actually, the X is an X prize, an X prize. It's X prize, it's an X prize. Uh, so there's a lot more dynamics. So that's the second dynamic. More people looking at it, more people encouraged to look at it. It's not so much just the science discoveries. So, oh, actually, this might actually be an area we should put money into. This is very interesting. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ron John, for that answer. Um, a question for Roger from, from the chat. Um, any tips for people who want to make the jump from tech to VC, as you did? Yeah, I, I, uh, I think uh, VC, especially early stage one, uh, it's a, it's a very, uh, like, uh, uh, we'll, we'll need a more uh, like uh, people so with uh, like technology backgrounds to join and uh and it's because it's not uh simply about uh uh the the 
the the the P and L of the companies, and so and uh, like uh, you can make uh, uh depends on where you are. I think you can start by uh joining an angel group, and uh, and uh, working uh with uh, local entrepreneurs and the startup experience uh, or the operator experience also uh, help here. A lot of VCs are looking for advisors as well as operating partners. That's another way to step into the uh, this field. And uh, I start by doing angel investment, being a venture and a venture partner and a scout for fund. And uh, but uh, my my original goal was different because I want to uh, start my own company. So I was trying to uh, just learn, get familiar with the. Uh, like the startup ecosystem before I fall in love with uh, like uh, investment. And let's learn let's the nature transition from uh, being an angel investor to start doing a syndicate, uh, leading an angel group. Now, as you okay. expand your network, get ready, you can, you can uh, also uh, think about launching your own fund. Yeah, I think that's how a lot of people uh, force their way into the industry. It's mm -hmm. very good advice. Um, shifting gears for a moment. Um, so DeepMind founder Mustafa Suleiman recently said we're simultaneously at peak AI hype, but still very early. Do you feel that rings true? I think so. The Gartner hype curve, those of you know that, it's sort of like this little yep. curve. It's got generative AI right at the top. So, you know, he's not the only one who thinks that. I think there's a lot of people who think he's peak peak uh interest at least and i do think it's a bit like the internet when we you know the circa 2000 where there was a lot of interest in internet lots of companies starting uh, lots of people educating themselves in the field um but it became something here to stay and again the question is does this it goes back to the beginning it's just this one of many things a bit like maybe the games mo no games have been in computing from day one Right. The first application of computers was playing games, <laughs> not this business stuff, enterprise software. Yeah. Playing games. Now, games, it turns out, has never gone away. It's still here. It's still here. Come, come hella high water, ups and downs from all these other technologies. Games is still here. Yep, and I there. think AI is a little bit like that. Uh, that you're gonna, it's, it's always. I've always thought it's hot. I think Roger too, right? We've been in the field for decades. <laughs> I've always thought it's hot and cool. So I don't. Okay, people say, "Oh, it's hot now." The difference now it's mainstream. Uh -huh. People go on to Chat GPT and say, "What you mean? I can I can write in English. I can do that, right?" right. So it's, a, it's maybe a false sense of uh, complacency because as you sort of double click, is a lot more. You know, you have to do a lot more. But it has commoditized it, uh, so more people can work on it, and we should get a million new companies. Out of this right. mobile guy, mobile app store. I you know I invented the first mobile app store. Um, you know, I feel proud. I probably generated 10 million engineering jobs, a million new companies, not me by myself, but the concept. I think that's what AI is gonna do. We might get a million new companies in different areas. It might be two-man shops, it might be um, you know, sophisticated big techie type companies. Uh, so that's what I think. Roger, anything you'd like to add there? Uh, it's very hard to comment on this uh, without knowing the full context. It's interesting that uh, I recently started reading Musatava's book, The Coming Wave. Right, so I only finished the first few chapters. He has been uh, wired, uh, like he expressed that how surprised he see the technology moving. He also expressed concern. Uh, if uh, if I have to just by looking at uh, his uh, his uh, what he meant by the we are at the peak of AI hype, it probably means the like the money is uh, being or like the public attention being put on the AI, right? So like uh, the fifty uh, billion dollars was invested last year in AI start on on generative AI startup, but it's uh, at, like the, as Roger mentioned, it will get Gartner's uh, like curve. Like uh, company building is hard. It may take another two to three years for the really killer app to to be uh to be used or like uh, get get into the mainstream. So uh this is if this is like if from the, the short term of view AI is hype, but from the long term view, they like, still have a long way to go. So we have a really long runway. Yeah. 
zooming out here for a moment, every bubble has like its picks and shovels, right? Uh, what are the picks and shovels of uh, AI? Well, I think certainly uh, right now, today, are chips, right? Is the uh, yeah. uh, whether that will stay the same is another quite like my other comment. People just figure out how to run it. I know Intel has ambitions, just run it on your laptop, you know. Uh, 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 the other uh, components is uh, data management tools, right? As we know, you can collect data, but cleaning the data is a real, real pain. Uh, so, uh, in, in being able to do that. Uh, and then um, education, you know, I'm, I'm voting my fee. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't do it for more of altruistic uh, purposes rather than uh, money making. But there's a whole set of loads and loads of courses. Universities, pretty much every university is beefing up their enrollment for data science, computer science. Uh, you know, sometimes they have an artificial intelligence course. Right. Uh, that's big. You know, so you can picks and shovels, teach people how to do it instead of doing it. Uh so there's, there's a sort of a, a a rhyme there, of course, that's rather negative, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, that sort of ties into another question I had, like um, to piggyback on what you said, like, oh, anyone can uh, write English now. That also enables some stuff like um, scamming being more prevalent and so on. So we're also, I guess, seeing like a whole industry pop up around companies that are trying to mitigate some of the externalities about AI. Are, are those things you are looking at or? Well, there's a mini industry of companies who are in labs, companies, universities, uh, even in uh, government entities who are trying to uh, look at that space. And it's a bit like an arms race, really. Uh, just like in anything, we've had spam before. That's nothing new, oh. right? And just like it's nothing new, there's an arms race to control it. Um, a whole set of tools, a whole set of um, people trying to do intrusion detectors, uh, trying to find signatures or is it a good guy or a bad guy? The problem is you stop everything. You stop the good guys too, right? right. You, know, you stop getting email. You, you can go on your email and do you know, increase your spam filter. Then all of a sudden you, you find, well, you're not getting any email from, email from your friends either. How did everyone <laughs> It's the same dynamic. Okay. Roger. Yes. Uh... So for me, uh, like uh, uh, I I try to prioritize in a few areas uh, I know better, such as like cybersecurity or the privacy side things. Of, of course, there are many other areas which are also uh, were interesting. I feel that like, yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Let me look at the chat for the most upvoted question. Uh, it's a question for Ron John. Um, what are the big themes uh, currently in longevity, neuroscience, mind body, integrative medicine, and human science that you think will <laughs> define the next 10 years? That's a handful. <laughs> well, you should actually, uh, I think, well, I was at the Stanford Big Ideas in Medicine conference. I was talking there last year where I introduced the concept of an aging vaccine. Uh, so that's one idea. Other idea was the concept of uh, of diagnostics, prevention before. Now, can you predict disease before you get the disease? It turns out a lot of things. If we can actually catch it early, uh, then we can actually stop it. Uh, so there's a whole uh, set of. Um, you know, I had the uh, Grail test. Uh, there's a trial going on. It's normally nine hundred fifty dollars, but the trial you can apply to. I think Google the Pathfinder project. And it's a test that tests 50 cancers all at the same time. Uh, and uh, if you can actually catch a cancer early, then it can solve. So a whole diagnostics area can sort of just stop you making unforced errors, i.e. I getting a disease where you're not supposed to. Uh, the third thing, I think, is um, changing old cells into young cells. That's more cutting edge. You know, that's we've shown it in at the cell level. We've shown it in mice. Will it work in humans? We don't know. Uh, the fourth thing is, uh, but there is $3 billion at Altos Labs trying to figure that out, uh, as well as a number of other companies, Turn Bio, which we we, we are in, and uh, uh, a number of other companies that look at look in that whole area. And then um, what we, uh, the, the next thing uh, is basically gene editing. 
right? Right now, the dirty secret of gene editing is you can really only edit one gene. Uh, as soon as you try to edit multiple genes, it's too difficult, more difficult. So there's a whole mini industry of second generation labs, companies trying to edit a long tail of genes. And that's most diseases need more than one gene. Okay, we've almost hit the top of the hour and I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Maybe as a closing question, uh, as mentioned, we have a lot of new managers here. What, what, what's some closing advice you'd have for people who want to start a fund in AI today? Start investing your own money a little bit. I mean, there are crowdfunding portals, uh, 10 companies, you know, maybe you know, as little as $1,000 each. If, you, if you're not that, you, know, you can actually do that and try and get a feel what investing feels like. Uh, just cut your budget, you know, whatever it is, whether it's 10K or 100K or a million to you know, five, 10 companies, and then you start interacting. Awesome. Roger? Uh, yeah, beside uh, uh, beside that, I think folks on uh, like uh, the the fundamental uh, uh problems like business one one, what the problems uh, like uh, you you are solving and uh, who is your customers and uh, like uh, uh, folks on the areas uh, you you know and identify those uh, pain point and looking also investing people. Yeah. Thank you so much. This was a uh, very thought provoking panel discussion. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Ron John, for your thoughts. And with that said, bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Yeah. bye.